Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be giving this talk here. I'd like to wholeheartedly thank uh, Daniel and Jan for, uh, for both inviting me, but most of all for organizing this series of, uh, of seminars, which has been really great. And it's been uh, essentially making the best of, of this really tough situation. And it's, uh, it's, it's really wonderful that we've had these one world, uh, these one world seminars. So thank you very much. So uh, yeah, as uh, Daniel mentioned, I'll be talking about Bose gases, and I'll be talking about an, uh, an effective equation that we've been uh, we've been playing around with and, and, com and computing properties of, and so forth. Uh, before I begin, let me uh, perhaps start by uh, giving credit where credit is due. Um, everything that I'll be talking about here uh, is is joint work with. Um, with uh, Eric Carlin from uh, Rutgers University, Marcus Holtzman from Grenoble, and Elliot Lieb from Princeton University. And if you're interested in details uh, about this, this is mo a lot of what I'll be talking about today is ongoing work, but we actually already have uh, one paper that's, uh, that's out on the archive and that is uh, going to be published soon. So if you're interested in details about this, there's the, uh, the archive number is, is, uh, is down here. Uh, I also usually like to to put the link to my website here where you can find uh, more preprints and, and more up to date news. Uh, I also uh, have the have my slides on the on the website and uh, the the link to the slides is actually available in the chat if you want to follow the slides in parallel. Okay, so that's uh, okay. So without further ado, let's uh, let's get into it. Um, and okay, so what I'll be talking about today is an interacting Bose gas. And in this first slide, I'll essentially be uh, laying down some uh, some notation. So this, this should should be familiar to uh, to most of you. So I'll be talking about a, a many-body Bose gas with a repulsive interaction. So the Hamiltonian that I'll be considering is here. The important part in the Hamiltonian is that I have a pair potential, uh, which is is over here, which is rotationally symmetric. It only dep depends on the, the distance between the particles. It's non-negative, so this is what we mean by repulsive. Uh, and it has to decay uh, fast enough. And fast enough in this, uh, in this case means that it has to be integrable. Uh, yes, and, and uh, we'll be looking at this Hamiltonian in three dimensions. So this is the, the standard many-body uh, Bose gas Hamiltonian. Uh, and, in, and for the entire talk today, uh, I'll be focusing on only the ground state of this Hamiltonian, which I'll be denoting, denoting by psi zero, and the ground state energy I'll be denoting by E zero. Now, another thing that's important about, uh, about the setup here uh, is that uh, we're going to be considering everything in the thermodynamic limit. So this means that uh, we fix a density rho, and we take the limit as n goes to infinity, where n, where the number of particles divided by the volume, is, is fixed to rho. And in the thermodynamic limit, we'll be looking at uh, a few observables. Mostly I'll be focusing on today uh, the ground state energy per particle, which is over here. It's E0 over N, and the condensate fraction eta zero. Uh, so uh, as I, I suppose most of you may know, uh, one expects for this Hamiltonian a Bose-Einstein condensate, which means that uh, a macroscopic number of particles are going to be in the same state, and this state for this, uh, this Hamiltonian is the constant state. So the condensate fraction is the average in the ground state of the projection onto the constant state. Okay, so that's the, the basic setup that, uh, that we'll, be, we'll be looking at. Now, um, this, um, okay, so the fact that the Bose gas has this repulsive interaction in it makes things difficult to to compute. And by difficult, I mean that proving things analytically for uh, the interacting Bose gas is all, typically requires non-trivial proofs. Um, but it's even, even worse than that. Uh, even numerically, it's generally difficult to treat the interacting Bose gas, the reason being that the interaction induces correlations between particles. And if one wants to do numerics about this, you ha one has to truncate the number of particles, consider a finite number of particles, uh, but this finite number of particles can't be too large because it, it gets, the, the complexity of the computation gets, gets uh, much, much harder and harder as the number of particles goes up. And so if there's correlation between particles, 
then it can be difficult to simulate numerically, especially if these correlations become strong. So the way that is, uh, so however, there, there are uh, techniques that uh, have been well established for uh, a very long time to, to try and extract information about this complicated Hamiltonian anyways. And so let me just just um, mention a, a, a few of the, of the standard things that are done to, to study the many body Bose gas. And I'll start with uh, focusing on the low density regime. So if I take this parameter rho and I, and I keep it low, uh, a lot of things can be computed about the Bose gas. And the usual technique to compute these, these observables is to use something called Bogolyubov theory. So this is something that was introduced, is a technique that was introduced in a paper by Bogolyubov in, in 1947. And what it is essentially, it's an approximation scheme. It tells you which approximations to do in which order. Uh, and once you've, you've done, you, once you follow the scheme, you end up with an effective one particle problem. So something that you can explicitly, uh, that you can explicitly compute uh, the observables in. And the ability to explicitly compute these observables gives one predictions. So at, the, at this level, so, oh, so far, they're really just predictions because it's an approximation scheme. So there's, uh, there's uh, some uh, non-rigorous steps in, in the meantime. So this doesn't give you proofs about the Bose gas, but you get predictions. Uh, and, there's, uh, and most of the predictions I'll be talking about today can be found in this, this uh, very, very nice uh, seminal important paper by Li Huang and Yang from 1957. And in particular, as far as the observables that I was talking about earlier are concerned, at low density, the Bogolyubov theory tells us um, what the energy and what the condensate fraction should look like. And so in this paper from 57, one finds uh, an, an expansion, a low density expansion for the ground state energy, with, which has come to be called the Li Huang Yang formula, uh, which uh, if you have, have never seen this before, uh, the only non-trivial thing in here is the, the parameter A is, this, is the so-called scattering length of the potential. It's a quantity that one can compute from the potential. And what's very significant about this is that the ground state energy at low density, the first two orders only depend on the potential through the scattering length A. So it's some sort of a universality result uh, from that point. Anyways, there's a, a very explicit expression for the first two orders of the, of the ground state energy. Similarly, the condensate fraction has this very explicit expression, uh, which is over here, also depends only on the scattering length. Um, and, um, and yeah, and what's, what one thing that one sees that is important here is as the density goes to zero, the condensate fraction eta zero goes to one. So you have full condensation in the limit uh, in which the density goes to zero. So all of this is at the level of, of uh, Bogolyubov theory. So this is at the level of the approximation that was introduced there. Uh, and then there was a significant amount of work that was done uh, since uh, the, the 40s and the 50s to go ahead and prove these predictions. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is typically difficult. Uh, and in fact, the, the formula for the energy, which is over here, was only recently proved. Uh, so this um, and it, it went through a number of, of different milestones. Here, I'm, I'm, only citing, uh, I'm only citing some of the, the perhaps more uh, splashy milestones. So in, uh, in 98, the very first term in the expansion was proved by Li Van Ingvason. Yao and Yin later proved in, all the way in 2009 uh, that the second term is an upper bound. And finally, it's only last year that, uh, that Søren Pune and, and Philip Solovey proved uh, prove the lower bound, concluding the proof of the of the energy asymptotics for small small density. So, which means that the Bogolyubov prediction uh, has been proved for the Bose gas, and so and so is correct. Now, the situation for the condensate fraction is a bit more complicated. So far, in the thermodynamic limit, which is what we'll be focusing on in this talk, uh, the the proof of the of the condensate fraction asymptotics is still open. Um, in fact, the proof that there is any Bose-Einstein condensation in the thermodynamic limit of positive density is, uh, is an open problem. However, there are results uh, in a scaling regime called the gross pitayevsky regime, which is uh, it's called a scaling regime because it uh, is defined by uh, scaling the potential in terms of the number of particles. And the effect of taking this scaling is to drive the density all the way down to zero. So it's an ultra-dilute limit. And in the gross pitayevsky regime, 
uh, one can do a lot more. And in particular, uh, one can prove condensation. So the, the existence of condensation uh, was first proved by Lieben Seiringer in 2002. Uh, there's a, here's, I, I'm, I'm quoting this more recent result in which uh, uh, Bo, uh, Kara Boccaccio, Christian Brennecker, Serena Chanatiempo, and Benjamin Schlein uh, proved that, in fact, the condensation is complete, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that in a probabilistic sense, almost all particles are in the condensed state in the Gross-Pitievsky regime. And once you find yourself in the Gross-Pitievsky limit, you're at zero density, and then there's lots of things you can do. So in particular, here I'm uh, citing a, a paper where um, they even compute the, the excitation spectrum, so go beyond the ground state. So, that, so that's uh, what I wanted to say about low density. Now, we can also look on the other side of the coin. We can look at high density. And at high density, there also are predictions uh, from, from, uh, from Bogorybov theory. So it gives a, a recipe to, to make uh, other approximations which give predictions at high density. And in particular, and this, uh, this can be found in the original paper by Bogorybov in 47, the ground state energy at high density has this, this very simple form, which is no longer universal. It now depends on the details of the, of the potential but it looks like rho over two times the integral of v. Now it turns out that at high density, things are quite a bit easier. And in fact, this formula was proved, uh, this, uh, this is the, the, um, the, uh, the reference that I know, it may even have been done before. I, uh, so this is, is done in an appendix of this, uh, of this paper by, by Leap from 1963. And so that's uh, uh, a little simpler. Uh, I just wanted to mention that the, the analog of the gross pitievsky regime for low density uh, at high density is the Hartree regime, and that's also something that uh, it has been studied rather extensively. In particular, I'm, I'm, I'm citing here a result in which the, the excitation spectrum was also computed. So I won't, won't dwell too much on this. So, uh, okay, um, very good. So, uh, for the next few slides, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, restrict the problem a little bit, and I'll talk about mostly the energy for the next few slides. So let's summarize what we have, what we know for the energy so far. So um, essentially what I said over here is that uh, we can understand, we get predictions from Bogubov theory, which are provable for the Bose gas. And what we know about the energy is that if I plot the energy as a function of rho, so this is going to be the energy uh, and the y-axis and as a function of rho, this is a logarithmic, uh, a logarithmic scaling for, for the x-axis down here. Uh, at low density, we have this, this Li Huang Yang formula uh, that gives us the asymptotics for the energy. And at high density, uh, I drew here the, the Hartree energy in green. And for the, this plot, uh, the, I just chose a, a test potential that I'll be, be showing a number of plots for, which is the exponentially decaying potential. Okay, so this is what we can predict using Bogolyubov theory, and uh, which, after a lot of painstaking work, has been proved uh, for the Bose gas. Now, what I'll be talking about today uh, is another approach that is different from Bogolyubov theory that uh, will also reduce the many-body problem to a one to a to a one-body problem that that we can we can prove things for and that we can compute compute stuff for as well. So it's an alternative approach to Bogolyubov. Uh, and what I'm going to do is, I'm, so in a minute, I'm going to show you how, we, how, we, um, how one gets to this, this alternative approach. But before I do, I want to give you a little teaser of what is, what is coming to try and motivate uh, the reason that ultimately that we're looking at this, uh, uh, at this effective equation. And so I'm going to show you a prediction given by this, this uh, one particle effective equation for the ground state energy as a function of rho. And I'll superimpose it on here. And so it's this blue curve, blue curve over here. So this is the prediction that is given by the effective theory. And as you see, it seems to, to reproduce the, the Li Wang Young result at low density. And it also reproduces the Hartree result at high density and gives an interpolation in the middle. So this, um, so I'll, I'll say a lot more about this effective equation, but I hope that this should be enough to pique your cur curiosity that there's something interesting going on here. This is an effective equation that is working both at low density and at high density. So let's look at uh, what this effective equation is and how it comes 
from the many body Hamiltonian. What, what approximation scheme we're going to be looking at, we're, we're going to be using. So before I go into that, uh, let me mention, first of all, that this effective equation, uh, this is not a new result. This was actually derived in a paper by, by Elliott from 1963. Uh, and it seems, at least as far as we know, that it has largely, largely been forgotten since then. So um, Elliott did a few computations in 63, saw some few, a few promising things, uh, but um, the state of computers back in the day was not, not good enough to do any meaning, meaningful numerics with this, uh, this, simple, with this equation. Um, and yeah, it's, it seems to have gone into, into disuse. Um, but so yeah, so the, the derivation that I'm going to, to present today, the, to present right now, can actually be found in that, in that paper from 63. So what is the idea? The idea uh, is, to, so we're going to try and compute the ground state energy for the Bose gas. So let's start with, uh, with the eigenvalue equation for the ground state energy, which is over. Now, the typical thing that one might do to compute the energy, the, the thing that you might be used to, is to take this equation and take a scalar product with psi zero. And if you do that, you'll end up with an expression for the energy, um, for the energy on the right side that involves the one particle reduced density matrix on the left side. However, what we're going to do here is slightly different. Instead of taking the scalar product with psi zero, I'm going to integrate both sides of the equation with respect to all of the variables. Essentially, this means that I'm taking a scalar product with respect to the constant function, which incidentally is the condensate, is the condensate function for this problem. Now, if I integrate the left-hand the left side over here, so this is the, the Hamiltonian, which I wrote earlier, and I'm integrating this over all variables. Oh, incidentally, it's something I didn't mention in the very first slide. Uh, we're going to be considering this problem with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, actually, it turns out to be important for the details of the, of the computation. So, Okay, so the very first thing that you might notice is that this, uh, the kinetic term of the Hamiltonian, once you integrate it over all variables, that just drops out because I'm integrating an exact derivative over, over, a periodic, over a periodic box. So the kinetic term entirely drops out. And this is a great advantage to taking an integral of this with respect to taking a scalar product with psi zero because you completely drop the, the kinetic term. And so you're just left with the potential term and the potential term, you can simplify quite drastically. Uh, you use the, the, the symmetry of the ground state wave function psi naught uh, to get rid of this sum. So this sum over pairs of particles just turns into a prefactor, which is the number of pairs of particles. And then you end up with an integral over two variables of the potential, and then the integral of psi naught over all the remaining variables. So this is a, a very simple computation, which, uh, which you can do. Uh, then on the right, you get the ground state energy multiplied by the integral of psi zero, and I just take this integral and I put it downstairs and I get an expression for E zero. Now I wrote this slightly suggestively with this, this ratio over here, and in fact I can rewrite this equation in terms of this ratio. So first, first what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to, def, to give a name to this ratio, and this name will be, G, will, will be in terms of this function G index two, but I'll define these in general. So I can define G index N as the, the integral of psi naught over the N plus one through capital N particles. Uh, so I integrate over all but N particles, by, but N positions, and then I normalize this appropriately. And so what this shows down here is I can write the ground state energy E zero as an integral of V times G two times a prefactor, times a prefactor over here. Now, why did I write things this way? Well, these GNs, they have a nice, they have a nice interpretation because psi naught is the ground state of the Bose gas. And there's something that you, can, uh, that you can prove very easily. It follows immediately from a power for Benius, uh, to show that the, the ground state psi naught is actually a real function. And it's not only real, it's a non-negative real function, which means that psi naught can be thought of as a probability distribution. It defines a probability distribution. And in terms of this probability distribution, so actually specifically if I divide psi naught by the volume to the power n, um, if I look at that probability e distribution, the gn's are the correlation functions for this probability distribution. So these gn's, they have a probabilistic interpretation um, in, this, uh, in this language. Okay, so, what I've done here is I've reduced the computation to, um, 
uh, the computation of the energy is now reduced to the computation of this correlation function G2. Now, how am I going to compute the correlation function G2? Well, I can do something that's very similar. I start with the same eigenvalue equation over here, but instead of integrating over all variables, I integrate over all variables but the first two. And if I do that, this is, is again an easy computation. It's pretty much just straightforward. You have to write down all the terms that you get and you collect them. You found, find an equation that is going to involve G2, but because of the, of the, so it's going to involve G2 with a kinetic term here and a potential term, but because of the, inter, of the interaction with the other particles, I'm also going to have a term that depends on G3 and a term that depends on G4. So what I, I get here is not so much an equation for G2, but rather it's a, it's a hierarchy of equations for Gn. It's a hierarchy because if I want to compute G3 and G4, I can do the same thing, integrate again, and I'll find an expression for G3 and G4 that depends on G5 and G6, and so forth. Okay, so so far we haven't made any approximations. This is an exact computation, and now the, approximation, the approximations come in. So we're going to make an assumption which is going to truncate this hierarchy. And this is essentially the, the it's a, a very natural thing to do. Perhaps it's the simplest, simplest way of truncating this hierarchy is to say that the correlation functions G3 and G4 are expressible in terms of the correlation functions G2. So said in this way, what I'm saying is somewhat analogous to saying that the probability distribution psi naught should be somewhat Gaussian. Uh, and so we'll actually be assuming a little more than that. We'll be assuming that, that G3 really is written uh, as a product of these, of these three G2s and, and the same thing for G4. Um, this is not a crazy assumption in certain regimes. Uh, so let me explain a little, bit, uh, a little bit how. So for instance, if the distance between X1, X2, and X3 are all pretty large, then this is something that one might expect uh, is, not too, is not too bad. Um, essentially, this is saying that when the distance between the particles is large, then the, the three-point correlation function is essentially a product of pair correlation functions. This, prob this uh, property of probability distributions is uh, usually called the clustering property of a probability distribution, and it's something that one can expect to be true for probability distributions coming from particle systems, at least when the distance between the, the particles is sufficiently large. And the distance between particles is large if the density is small. Now, if the density is large, these assumptions are also not, not completely crazy. The idea is that when the, if the density is large, I essentially end up with a, with a soup of, of, of particles, with a mean field soup of particles. Everyone is going to be interacting with uh, a very large number of neighbors, and I'm going to end up in some sort of a mean field situation uh, in which uh, correlation is not going to propagate uh, very, very far away. And so the, so, Again, the three-body correlations, the fact that they're products of two-body correlations is not such a crazy assumption. But for the rest of the talk, we're, we're go just going to take these as an assumption. Uh, yeah, so this is the, the, the big approximation that we're making. And now, once I've made this assumption, then G3, I can rewrite as a product of three G2s. G4, I can rewrite as a product of G2s. And so I end up with an equation here, which is an equation for G2. So again, you have to go through the computation, uh, combine some terms, take the thermodynamic limits, and once you've done all of that, so that's a little bit of, a little bit of work, but it's, it's uh, doable, you end, up with a, you end up with an equation for G2. And I wrote down the equation here, um, so let me first mention that, um, yeah, so the first thing that I'm going to do here is to do a change of variables. Instead of looking at G2, I'm actually going to be looking at one minus G2, uh, which I call U, the main reason why we're doing this is that it turns out that G2 of x goes to 1 as x goes to infinity. Uh, so it's convenient to look at, uh, to look at 1 minus G2. Uh, and so we get an equation uh, for, for u, which looks slightly barbaric. Uh, the, these first two terms here uh, are a Schrodinger equation, which is nice. But then you have these, these extra terms over here, which involve convolutions. Um, so these terms are pretty severely nonlinear. They're pretty severely non-local as well. But this equation is a one-particle equation. It's a, an equation for the function u, which depends on x, which is in R3. I now only have one, uh, one degree of freedom. Well, three degrees of freedom, but it's, it's only one particle. 
Okay. Despite the fact that this is a one particle equation, it turns out that this equation over here is still rather complicated. Uh, it's uh, as far as we, so we, we don't have any, any tools to study this analytically, but even numerically, it's difficult. We actually did, uh, did write some code to, to uh, compute things for this full, this, this, uh, full equation. Um, the code is kind of slow and it's kind of imprecise in certain regimes. So it's, it's difficult to deal with this, with this equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to, in the spirit of, of uh, making, of making approximations, we're going to rip off pieces of this equation to end up with something that we know how to deal with. And we're actually going to be looking at two stages of the, of this approximation scheme. The first thing that I'm going to do is to make to the first simplification consists in simplifying only this L term. So I'll keep the K as, as is, and I'll simplify the L term. What I'll do, I'll drop these two terms in here. These, this, this term is cubic in U and this term is quartic in U. And one might expect that, at least at low density, so if the distance between the particles is sufficiently large, then U should be rather small because U goes to zero as X goes to infinity. So I'm, going to, I'm just going to drop these two terms and approximate L by, the, by just the first term. Now, the resulting equation that we get there is something that we're going to, that for the rest of the talk, I'll be calling the big equation. I call the big equation because the next thing that I'll do is to reduce that to uh, to something simpler and smaller. Now the big equation is still somewhat complicated to treat analyti analytically, but it is something that we can conveniently compute with uh, and, and do numerics with. Uh, so I'll, I'll be saying more about that uh, in a little bit. But first, uh, yeah, so, but, we, but it's still difficult to prove anything really analytically about the big equation. So I'm going to rip out some more uh, nuts and bolts from this equation and and simplify, and simplify the equation a little further. And what I'll end up with is a new equation, which we call the simple equation. So we'll have the big equation and the simple equation. Now the approximations that we're getting, doing for the simple equation, they're of the same, um, same flavor of, as the previous one. So we're going to be assuming that u is small. So in places where one minus u appears like this, we'll be approximating that by u. Uh, we'll also be taking one of the terms that appeared here, which was this capital S over here, which is one minus u times v, and approximate that by a delta function. The idea being that if you look from a long, from a, uh, from if you look at it from pretty far away, then any function kind of looks like a like a delta function. And so if we do this, again, it's a little bit of work, not, nothing too difficult. Uh, we end up with an equation which looks uh, a bit simpler, and this is the equation that we call the simple equation, and this is. Uh, the one for which we have theorems and we can talk about analytically. So what does this equation look like? So again, uh, the, these first two terms over here, that's just a Schrodinger equation. In fact, it's the scattering equation for the potential V. Uh, and then I have these two correction terms over here, um, which both of these correction terms are nonlinear. This is, so the first one actually just looks like a mass term, but the, the number E that is over here uh, is actually a function of u. So in this equation, you should think that, that every e, for every e, you should plug in this expression. Uh, so this term is nonlinear. This term is quadratic in u and has the e in front of it. So it's a nonlinear term. It's also a non-local equation. It's non-local because the convolution is non-local, but also the expression for e is non-local. So it's a, a one-particle equation, which is non-linear, non-local. Um, but it's not so terribly difficult to, uh, to prove things for, for this equation. And in fact, what I'm going to do now is to show you a few theorems about what we, what we were able to prove about this equation. Now, the first theorem is, actually concerns the very existence of a solution. This is an equation that is, non, that is complicated, well, complicated or non-standard enough that it's not obvious it's to, to say that, oh yes, of course, this, this must have a solution. Uh, so this required a proof. Uh, in order to prove this, we had to make an extra assumption on the potential, which is actually slightly weaker than what I wrote here, but essentially uh, what we require is that the potential should also be an L2 function, uh, which is not a, not a terrible assumption. It's essentially saying that if, if I have singularities in the potential V, then these singularities are not, are not too steep, are not too strong. Uh, so yeah, so we were able to prove that there is a solution to this problem. And in fact, in proving it, 
uh, we actually provided a recipe to compute this, this um, to compute the solution for the simple equation. Okay, so that's good. The simple equation has a solution. Now, let's go back to the physical observables that I talked about earlier, and let's look at what we can prove for the energy of the, of the simple equation. So I showed you this, uh, this graph at, uh, before, I, I talked about the, before I talked about the derivation of the equation, which showed that the simple equation um, was coinciding with the Bose gas at low density and at high density. And essentially, this is what I'm showing here are theorems that prove exactly that picture. So at high density, uh, we were able to prove that the, the energy uh, behaves at high density like rho over two times the integral of V, which you, you might recall from, uh, from earlier on is, um, is the, the behavior for the energy of the Bose gas. Uh, incidentally, one thing that I'll comment on a little more towards the end, for the Bose gas, we assume that, the, that we, this is true if the Fourier transform of the potential is non-negative. Uh, for the simple equation, it turns out this is true always. Uh, I'll comment on that towards. So at high density, we, reproduce, we, we get Hartree's energy. At low density, we get this expression for the, for the, for the energy uh, from the simple equation, which is exactly the Li Huang Yang uh, formula that we have uh, that, that uh, has recently been proved for the Bose gas. So for low energy, the asymptotics of the energy predicted by the, by the, the simple equation is the same as the Bose gas. Oh, uh, one notational comment, maybe I should have made this earlier. Um, little e is going to be the prediction of the energy made by the simple equation or the big equation. E zero, e, e sub sub zero is the actual ground state energy of the Bose gas. So whenever I, I write little e, it's, it's not the energy of the Bose gas, it's a, it's a prediction for the energy that comes from, from one of these things. Okay, so these two, two theorems together, they essentially prove the picture that I, that I showed at the very beginning, uh, that the simple equation gives the correct asymptotics for low density and the correct asymptotics for high density. Now, a natural next question is, well, if things work well at low density and they work well at high density, what happens in the middle? Do we actually interpolate from low density to high density accurately? And so uh, what we did is to take the simple equation and the big equation as well and run some numerics with it and just see what kind of numbers we would get uh, for the energy as a function of the density. So here's a plot of the energy of a function, as a function of the density. It's essentially based on the, on the plot that I had, that I showed, showed earlier. So the dotted green line is the Hartree, the dotted yellow line is the Li Wang Yang. The blue curve over here, that's the simple equation. So that's the prediction for the ground state energy for the simple equation at all densities. The purple curve, which is down here, is the prediction for the big equation. Uh, so you see that, first of all, they're somewhat close to each other. They're not exactly on top, but they're somewhat close to each other. Um, and the big question here is how does this compare to the Bose gas? And to compare it to the Bose gas, we did some Monte Carlo computations, uh, which is essentially the state of the art for, uh, for computing numbers for, uh, for, say, the ground state energy of the Bose gas at arbitrary densities. Uh, and the Monte Carlo computations are the red crosses over here. So what you, what you see is, well, first of all, the simple equation at intermediate densities is close. It's doing the right thing, but quantitatively, it's not exactly, uh, it's not exactly where it's supposed to be. Uh, at, except at low density and at high density, of course, where everything meets up. But you see that the big equation, the big equation is right on the money. It's right on top of the, of the Monte Carlo point. Now, one thing that I wanted to mention, which is significant, is that in this plot, there are eight Monte Carlo points. Uh, these Monte Carlo points were computed by, uh, by one, of, uh, one of our co-authors, by Marcus Holtzman from Grenoble University. He is, he's an expert on doing Monte Carlo for Bose gases. You kind of need to be an expert in order to do such things because doing Monte Carlo is difficult. It's a little bit of an art form. It's it's not just something that you can you can plug in and expect to find uh, to find results that are uh, are correct. Uh, and it's computationally intensive. So these eight points were computed on a cluster at the University of Grenoble by an expert in the field. 
the purple curve, uh, the, so the solution of the big equation that has something like 200 points, uh, I computed on my laptop and I'm not an expert on anything. So this kind of go, uh, uh, proof goes to prove that uh, solving the big equation really is a lot easier than solving the many body problem. Even from a numerical point of view, it's much, much easier than, than going through the one curve. Okay, so the red crosses are right on top of the purple crosses. I can actually give you an order of magnitude of, of, of how, how close the purple curve ends up being. So this is a plot of, the, of what I call the, the relative error in the energy. What this is, this is the, the, predicted, the, predict, the predicted energy minus the Monte Carlo energy divided by the Monte Carlo energy. So it's a, the, the relative error that, that we get. Uh, this plot is actually for a slightly different potential. It's for two e to the minus x instead of e to the minus x. Essentially the red curve that's over here, we don't have for e to the minus x yet for uh, purely, uh, it's just we don't have it. There's no, no real reason why we don't have it. Um, but anyways, this is uh, the plot that I can, can show you now. And so you, you see that, the, that for this potential, the simple equation has a relative error of about 10%. The big equation has a relative error that's, uh, that's always, always does better than 0.1%. Uh, and perhaps uh, of some significance, I, I drew this red curve. This red curve uh, is a prediction of uh, the so-called Jastrow function. The Jastrow function is a technique that is used in computational uh, quantum physics to uh, reduce n-body systems to one degree of freedom. So it, it's, it's um, it's a way of expressing an, an n-body um, an n-body wave function in terms of the function of a single variable. Um, and uh, yeah, and so you see that the the big equation here is doing comparatively well. It's doing comparatively as well as the Jastrow. Ian, can I ask yeah. a question? Yes. So uh, the. Does this 0.1% mean anything? So is this numerical Monte Carlo results so reliable that you can talk about this 0.1% error? That's a very good question. So the, uh, the expert on Monte Carlo is mm -hmm. uh, Marcus Holtzman, who's one of, one of yes. our collaborators. Mm -hmm. um, and he assures that, uh, so he, he gives us error bars that are uh -huh. okay. much, lower mm -hmm. than, than much lower than this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so there is a difference. Yes, yeah, it's not, it's not exactly on top, mm -hmm. which is expected. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, um, there, there is no small parameter in the internet. Right, right, yes, yes, So yes. It, mm -hmm. it would be, it would be mm -hmm. a, a real, I mean, it would be mm -hmm. a, an extreme miracle if yeah. uh, we, could, we could be arbitrarily yeah. precise mm -hmm. in the internet. Mm -hmm. So there's okay. definitely a, a, mm -hmm. a minimum. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay, so okay, so this is the, the relative error for the energy. So uh, this is showing that the simple equation and the big equation are doing pretty well uh, for the energy. The simple equation has the right asymptotics, provably so, and the big equation is even doing quantitatively quite well in the intermediate region. But this is for the energy, and a lot more is known about the energy than, than, than other observables, and perhaps the observable that is more interesting to look at is the condensate fraction. This is more interesting because they're more open problems relating to, to late interval. Uh, so let's have a look at what the prediction for the condensate fraction is. Now, the first thing to notice is that it's not actually obvious that we can compute the condensate fraction using the simple equation. This is because the derivation of the simple equation and the big equation uh, was really focused on the ground state energy, on the computation of the ground state energy. However, uh, there's a simple way that what can turn the question of uh, computing the condensate fraction to computing energies, not the, the usual energies, not, not the usual energy, but some energy. And this is, is a simple technique where um, uh, essentially the idea is to take the Hamiltonian, so this is the Hamiltonian we had before, and to add an extra projector at the end of the Hamilton. So this term is a projection onto the condensate wave function. And I put a prefactor minus mu. The reason that it's minus mu is essentially conjunction. And not plus mu, or something like that. it's essentially conjunction. So now if I look at this Hamiltonian over here, uh, and I compute the ground state of that Hamiltonian, 
uh, from that ground state, I can compute the, from the, actually the ground state energy of this Hamiltonian with the mu, I can compute the condensate fraction. This is a simple little computation. Uh, the definition of the condensate fraction, uh, let me remind you, is the, the, the projection, it's the average uh, in the ground state of the projection onto the condensate wave function, no surprise there. But this I can rewrite as a derivative of the Hamiltonian HN with respect to mu. Uh, and so this identity is true because uh, the derivative of psi naught is, of course, orthogonal to psi naught. Uh, and so this, these are just, just uh, formally identical, but this is just a derivative with respect to mu of the ground state energy of the Hamiltonian. And then I take mu equals. So I can reduce the question of uh, the computation of the condensate fraction to computations of the energy. And this gives me, uh, this gives me a strategy to compute a prediction for the, ground, for the condensate fraction using the simple equation uh, and the big equation. Excuse me, what is mu zero? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, eta zero, this eta zero here? No, no, mu, mu zero. Uh, mu equals zero. Mu is just an extra parameter that I've added. No, 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 no. Uh, at, at, oh, at, here, at, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is mu equals zero. It's a typo, yes. It's a typo, yes, so sorry about that. This is mu equals zero. The subscript is right next to the equal sign. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is mu equal zero. So. Okay, so this gives us uh, a strategy. This gives us um, um, a strategy to compute uh, the condensate fraction in terms of uh, using the, the simple equation and the big equation. Incidentally, what I described here is not special to the condensate fraction. You can do all sorts of other, other observables. One particle observables are easy. Uh, easy-ish, uh, but we can also, also do particles that involve more, uh, observables that involve more particles. So um, we get a, okay, so following this, uh, this prescription, we get a prediction using the simple equation and the big equation. So as we did for the energy, let me first talk about predictions that we can prove using the simple equation. And what we can prove for the simple equation is that and in, in the low density regime, I end up with a, a formula, an asymptotic formula for the prediction of the condensate fraction, which coincides with vogel yubov's formula. So it coincides with uh, the best thing that we know about the, about the condensate fraction uh, for, for the boson. So of course, this is for the simple equation because for the big equation, we don't even have a proof that there exists a solution, but again, we can do numerics for the, for the, the big equation. And so similarly to what I showed for the, for the energy, these are numerics for the condensate fraction uh, using the simple equation and the big equation. The color key is essentially the same. So this is the condensate fraction as a function of rho for the potential e to the minus x. This uh, green dotted curve is the vogel yubov prediction. The blue curve is the simple equation over here. The purple curve is the big equation and the red crosses are Monte Carlo. Now the first thing that you notice is that things are not as good. In particular, the simple equation and the big equation are now pretty radically different. And this simply comes from the fact that they were actually different for the, for the energy as well, but it turns out that the computation of the condensate fraction is a lot more touchy than the computation of the, of the ground state energy. It doesn't suffer approximations as much. Uh, so the simple equation is a little off compared to the big equation. But now if you compare the big equation to the Monte Carlo prediction, Again, it's not as good as the energy. It's not right on top, but it's still pretty good. And in particular, the qualitative aspects of the behavior of the, of the condensate fraction on the, of, on the density are pretty much reproduced here. So in, in, in fact, the, uh, what one, one sees from the Monte Carlo is that the condensate fraction starts at one, then it should go down to a minimal value, and then it should go back up to one. And the densities at which this happens, at which it starts going down, and at which it starts going back up, they're pretty well uh, reproduced by the condensate, by the, by the big equation. Uh, so this really suggests that uh, the, the simple equation, but perhaps more so the big equation, is capturing an essential part of the physics of the, of the Bose gas. Something good is happening. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about the condensate fraction. I'll say just a couple words about just one more uh, observable. We also looked at the correlation function. So when I say correlation function, I mean the correlation function in the probability distribution psi squared, the usual correlation function that you would have 
for the Bose gas, um, where again, um, using Bogolyubov theory, you can make a prediction for what the correlation function should look, should look like. This was done in, in particular in the Lee Wang Young paper from 57, where any result that you want to have about the Bose gas needs to be in there, um, where they found that the correlation function should decay like one over x to the fourth. So there's some constant and one over x to the fourth. Now, similarly to the energy and the condensate fraction, we can prove something that's very, we can, we can prove the, this sort of, of result for the simple equation again. So uh, we have a result that says, that says that for the simple equation, under certain assumptions on the potential V, which as far as we understand are technical assumptions, uh, we find that the solution of the simple equation U actually decays like one over X to the fourth. And then using the same procedure as we did to compute, to compute the condensate fraction in terms of the energy, we can compute the two-point correlation function as well uh, using a, a similar approach. And what we can show is that if uh, the solution of the simple equation goes like one over x to the fourth, then the two-point correlation function also goes like one over x to the fourth. Now you may notice that uh, the, it, the constants that I wrote over here are written in a different way. We don't actually know whether they're the same or they're different. Uh, in the Lee Wang Young paper, there's no, uh, there's no expression, expression for the prefactor and we haven't. Uh, and we haven't uh, checked this yet. So we, we, what we know is, is the same as this behavior, this one over x to the fourth. Now, okay, so this is for the simple equation. Now I'll show you what we can do for the big equation, which again is numerical. Uh, so si this is still a work in progress. The plot that I'm actually going to show you is not for the condensate, it's not for the two-point correlation function sigma, it's for u, which is related to sigma in, in some way. So if I plot u as a function of x, so the solution of the simple equation as a function of x, incidentally, u also has a very well-defined formula in terms of the, of, the, of the ground state wave function, so in terms of the solution of the, of the Monte Carlo. And we can compare uh, the predictions of the simple equation, the big equation, and the Monte Carlo. Actually, to be really precise over here, these, these crosses are not the Monte Carlo. They come from the Jastrow function. Um, but uh, so we've done some tests and it seems that the Monte Carlo is very close. Anyways, this is kind of a, uh, a t there's one thing that I want to want to get out of this plot, uh, which, um, yeah, which I'll, I'll go into. Now, so the first thing that you notice is again, the simple equation is a little bit different from the big equation. It turns out that this is because this plot is actually using a, a fairly large value for the, for the potential. So we took the exponential potential and just cranked it up. And it's also at a rather high density. So it's at a density uh, that is very much in the middle of the intermediate regime. At low density, at low densities or for smaller potentials, the simple equation and the big equation, they agree much more. But I wanted to show you this plot uh, because it has an interesting feature. You see, as you crank up the density, the simple equation and the big equation start to become different. And this happens at a density at which uh, the big equation develops a feature, which is that this u of x dips below, uh, below the x-axis. It's, it has a small negative shoulder. When you start to develop that small negative shoulder, that's when the simple equation and the big equation start to, start to move apart from each other. And now if you translate this u back into, into a correlation function, what this means is that when this dip occurs, there's a little shoulder in the correlation function. There's a little bump in the correlation function which means that there's, there's a characteristic length in this problem uh, that is favored over other lengths. So the probability of finding two particles at a certain distance is a little higher than finding them at any other distance, which suggests that there's some non-trivial physics going on. So what it might be is, is still something that, uh, that uh, we're looking into. It might be something like a liquid phase or something like that, but there is some non-trivial physics going on uh, at these intermediate densities and so a question yeah is it a particular feature of the choice of the potential uh yes so the this uh so uh yes most definitely so what uh, what we've observed is if the potential um it, so the potential has to be strong enough but i guess you could also play with that by tweaking the density by tweaking the density row but if you change the potential you're going, to, you're going to change things a lot. So, so far on this, we only really have numerical evidence. So we've only investigated this for the potentials that we've looked at. 
but uh, it seems to be a, a feature which depends uh, depends on the potential. There might be um, there might be ways of reducing the problem to um, of uh, well of of looking at a slightly less high dimensional space as the space of potentials. But so far, as far as we can tell, yes, it depends on the on the specifics mm -hmm. of the question. In particular, it doesn't only depend on the on the um, on the scattering length. You can take two potentials that have the same scattering length; the picture will look very different. Thank you. Which is not surprising because this is, as I mentioned, intrinsically uh, a high density effect, and the scattering picture is just at high density is just not the appropriate thing. Okay, so right, so this is kind of an indication that. Um, that uh, something non-trivial and interesting is happening in this intermediate density region. Now, I'm going to come to my conclusions very soon. Before I get to that, uh, let me just make a couple comments about the, these equations. So, so far, I've only talked about things that work really well. I guess, uh, yeah. So I've only talked about things that work. Uh, there are things that don't work. Uh, so let me just spend a little bit of time on, on what doesn't work. And of course, there are things that don't work. The big equation and the simple equation are one particle problems. They cannot reproduce all of the complexity of the n-body Bose gas. It's just, that's just impossible. So there are, things, there are some aspects in which, uh, in which things fail. So first of all, this is something that I kind of said in passing, uh, but which is important. Uh, the simple equation and the big equation only work beyond low density if the Fourier transform of the potential is non-negative. In other words, if the potential is a positive type. This goes all the way back to the, the result that I showed about the, the prediction for the energy at high density, where I, I told you that the prediction we get for the simple equation is always one half times the integral of V, regardless of the sign of the Fourier transform of the potential. But for the Bose gas, it depends on the sign of the potential. In fact, there are examples in which uh, the potential is not a positive type, in which for large densities, the energy does not go like one half times the integral of v. So at high density, so everything is well defined at high at uh, for potentials that are not of positive type, but uh, the simple equation only agree and the and the big equation only agree with the um, with the the Bose gas at very low densities. If, in that case, so we kind of destroy the this, this uh, picture that I, I showed you. So it's important that uh, the potential be a positive type. We've also noticed, we've been playing around with different potentials, and we've noticed that in addition to the potential being a positive type, things tend to work less well if the potential is stronger. So if we multiply the potential by a constant, it looks less good. So uh, here's a plot. So here I'm looking at a potential that's slightly bigger. So I multiply the exponential potential by 16. Um, this is a plot for the energy. So you see that the simple equation is further from the Monte Carlo points and further from the big equation than it was for the smaller potential. Perhaps more dramatically, the condensate fraction, which again is, is a little touchy, uh, it's less good. So even the prediction for the condensate fraction for the big equation, even at some point, dips down below, below zero, which is obviously not, not physical. However, there are some things to be saved. The overall shape of the, of the curve is not too bad. So yeah, so it's less accurate for large potentials. OK, so let me uh, uh, kind of summarize what I said and then go into uh, some open problems that uh, are still left about this, actually a number of open problems about this. So I talked about uh, these two effective equations, the big equation and the simple equation, which are one particle uh, equations that somehow capture some of the, uh, the correlations in the Bose gas. Um, and yeah, so, and, and they capture these correlations in the, the nonlinear terms of, the, of, of these one particle equations. Now, what I showed is that um, for small and large densities, we have theorems for the simple equation that they reproduce some of the, some of the predictions of the Bose gas uh, in these asymptotic regimes, uh, which, which I detailed earlier. And this, um, this is interesting uh, for several reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, what we did is, uh, is quite different from Bogolyubov theory. The, the equation that we end up with is different from what you, you get, get using Bogolyubov theory. And the idea of what you do is also different. And since there are a number of open problems still 
uh, even in these asymptotic regimes for the for the the Bose gas, in particular, computing the condensate fraction at low density, for instance. The hope is that looking at things from this point of view, which is different from from what was done before, might uh, might give some insight onto, well, maybe what can be done to to try and look at these uh, at uh, at, at the Bose gas in these, these extreme regimes. Now, beyond these, the very small density and the very large density regime, I also show that we have uh, quantitatively accurate predictions at intermediate densities, at least for some potentials. Um, and yeah, at least so that depends on the potential, but for some potentials, it seems to be uh, true quite a bit. Uh, and this, this is also interesting because this opens up uh, the, the possibility of looking at the physics of the Bose gas at these intermediate densities, where as I, uh, as I tried to allude to when I talked about the correlation functions, in, these intermediate den in this intermediate density regime, it seems that there can be some pretty non-trivial things going on, some pretty physically interesting behaviors uh, happening uh, in this strongly interacting in regime of intermediate density. Uh, incidentally, uh, yeah, no, okay, let me skip it. Okay, so, uh, all right, so though this is why essentially uh, we think that these two equations are worth looking at. Now, there's still a number of open problems uh, that I like to mention. There are actually a, a few more than this, which uh, um, you'll find in, in the paper. So we're currently in the process of writing up these, these results and they should hopefully come out on the archive in the nearish future. Um, so there are some open problems about, uh, anal about our analytic results. So in particular, even for the simple equation, there's a number of things that we haven't really been able to prove. The things that I think have pestered us the most uh, are results about the monotonicity of the function of the energy as a function of rho. The potential is positive, so the energy should be a, a, an increasing function of rho. We were actually able to prove this for, for small rho and for large rho. Uh, it's a, a a fairly non-trivial proof, but it, it works, and we have bounds on when on on what small row and what large row are. Uh, but for some potentials, these two bounds don't meet. For some potentials, they do meet, so everything is pretty much done there. But for some potentials, they don't meet, and so there's uh, it would be interesting to to to, to be able to prove this monotonicity for the entire range of rows. Uh, similarly, uh, we would we expect the function rho times the energy to be a convex function of rho. This is actually equivalent to the compressibility being, being non-negative, which is something that physically should definitely be true. If you press down on the system, the density should go up. So no, no question there. Uh, for the simple equation, it's not so easy to prove. Again, we proved this for, I think actually for just small rho. Uh, other things would be to prove that the condensate fraction is between zero and one. The prediction of the condensate is between, condensate fraction is between zero and one, which is obviously true for the Bose gas. Uh, we also have a proof of this for small rho. Uh, it seems to be true for the simple equation. We've never seen a, a case in which it's not true. We did see cases in which for the big equation it's not true, but for the simple equation it uh, hasn't been the case. Now as far as analytic proofs are concerned, there are many more open problems for the big equation essentially because we don't have any analytical results for the big equation. The first step would be to prove that the solution exists or to construct a solution somehow. Um, and finally the big open problem is, well, so the, the point of view that I tried to have, have during this talk is that um, the way that Bogolyubov approached the Bose gas was to devise these approximations and make predictions that, that, that come out of this. And then later on in, in the decades that followed, these predictions were, were proved. The, um, the approach that we've taken here is, okay, so here's a different way of getting predictions does this give us a way to prove anything about the Bose gas? And the answer would be yes, if we uh, were able to relate uh, the, the, the simple equation and perhaps the big equation back to the, the many body Bose gas in a much more quantitative way, or even to show that asymptotically they have to be the same. Or something. So that, that would be the big open question that, that is left out. And on that, I'll thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you very much for this beautiful presentation. Are there questions? Yes. So yes, is, it, is there any concrete mean field limit or toy model or, what, or whatever in which you can 
you can show, justify this factorization assumption? So I think, so, all right, so as so far, we've discussed this kind of peripherally, but we've been mostly mostly focused on trying to get predictions and check that, that this is, okay. mm -hmm. is correct. Mm -hmm. I, sh I think that at low density, this should be possible. Uh -huh. At least okay. I, I hope that at low density, mm. there, this should be possible. It's kind of a tricky thing because it's not just to show that the factorization is true in the low density mm. limit. We have to mm. have some estimates on the error terms mm -hmm. that we would get there. And it's not something that would be entirely trivial and we haven't looked at this in, in much detail yet, but that is but, uh, what is down the line. Certainly. And I think that for small density, this uh -huh. might be doable. Is, is it possible that it becomes exact in the like the infinite dimension limit or I don't know, ah, with large n limit, whatever n is or, you know. That's, that's, a very, that's a very good question. Yeah, I haven't thought of about mm -hmm. playing with dimensions. Yes, that, uh, that is possible. I, I the mean, number of whom? Mm -hmm. In your derivation, uh, the dimension didn't play a role. That's so, right. uh, I mean, the, the scattering length uh, really, really depends on the dimension. It but, does. Uh, but it can be defined. That's, yeah. So, in fact, uh, a number of the results that we have on the simple equation are actually true in every dimension. So, I, I only talked about three dimensions here. Uh, because that's where we have explicit predictions for the for the energy and for the condensate fraction of, and so forth. But these equations, they can be constructed in any dimension. They make perfect sense. Uh, the existence of a sol of of the solution is true in every dimension. Uh, yeah. So it, it is something that we can look in look at in any dimensions. We did actually have a look at things in one and two dimensions. So in one dimension, this was actually studied in a paper by by Elliot. So this 1963 paper where things were introduced was actually part of a series of three papers about this, uh, about this equation. The first paper was about three dimensions. The second paper was about Coulomb interactions and the third paper was about one dimension. And there, he, he found some results there uh, already in one dimension. We've looked at this also in two dimensions. Uh, we found some interesting things, um, but nothing's really in its, in its final state. Uh, we haven't looked at all at more than, than three dimensions. That's an interesting point though, that it's possible that the infinite dimension and limit carries some information. Yeah, that's, that's an idea to be investigated. Other questions? So I have one question. So in your derivation, in principle, it could work at positive temperatures as well. Uh, so the thing that is specific to the ground state is the positivity, the positivity of the of the wave function. In fact, the um, so this this is this is something that I find I find very titillating, which is that the only the only time we're ever using the fact that we're looking at the ground state is through the positivity, and the positivity is not even used in the equation. It's used to justify the to justify the approximation that we're making. So. If you were to to have any sort of um, of excited state, the 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 simple equation would be identical, so it would give exactly the same prediction. So that's kind of where uh, where the ground steadiness of the problem comes in. Now that being said, uh, we do have access to low uh, to low energy excited states uh, because so there's this um, uh, so the the thing that we we've been looking at uh, is. Uh, Using is is a, a relation between uh, the excitation <coughs> spectrum and the two point correlation function, which is called the Feynman Beal expression, which, as far as I understand, is non rigorous. But anyways, it's an expression for it. Um, and since we can compute the two point correlation functions, we may have access to the low dent to the to the low energy um, to the low energy mm -hmm. excitations, and maybe from there be able to look at at small temperatures. That might. Be but if you replace the the ground state. So wave functions by by a Gibbs kernel that's also positive, so that might also work. Uh, that's yes, uh, but that's true. So if you you replace it by a but but the uh, the derivation then would look uh, different, right? Because the you wouldn't have you wouldn't have the wave functions. You wouldn't have the Laplacian. You wouldn't have the cancellation of the kinetic term. I mean, so what, mm -hmm. what what's making me think that that this would not work so well is that 
the equation that we would get would be the simple equation. There's no, there's no other parameter coming in. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so it might be possible to redo the derivation with the Gibbs state, but it would look, uh, it, it would, it would look different. And what yeah. does your theory give for the ideal Bose gas? Uh, for the non-interacting Bose gas, yeah. Okay, so uh, yes. So if you turn the interaction off, that's the, that would be something we can do. Yeah. So if you turn the interaction off, uh, then what are you left with? Uh, you know. Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, we didn't look at that. Well, but psi zero is just just the product of the same single function, single particle wave function. So right, that's right. Like g two is just the product of two psi nodes, uh, things right. like that. So you know. yeah, yeah. Uh, but so I, I think it's slightly so you don't see this factor is uh, and and psi zero is a constant function, right? You're in period of periodic boundary condition, so. Yeah, everything okay. is constant. Yeah. So the, the derivation would actually be pretty good. We'd have to look at these approximations that might they might all be exact. Uh, we'd have yeah. So it, it's it's actually it would actually be a simple problem to take the simple equation, set v equal to zero, and look at what comes out. Uh, that should be u oh yeah, equals zero. Just, it's just the Laplacian of u is equal to zero. Yeah, it's just u equals zero. Yeah. So u is equal to zero. So all the approximations are. Are, are appropriate and you just have the constant function. Yeah, so in the, as V goes to zero, you get the constant function. Yeah, but you can also take the Dirichlet boundary conditions. Right, so that's something that, yeah, so you can do that, but you would have to go through the derivation again because this, uh, <laughs> this assumes periodic boundary conditions and that's actually important because the translation invariance is important for the derivation. Yeah. If you do Dirichlet boundary conditions, it's going to change the derivation, and hopefully, if you do that, you would end up with the, with an equation that would reproduce the that would reproduce the non-interacting uh, the non-interacting wave function. Mm. Yeah. So uh, breaking translation invariance is something that uh, I guess I could have mentioned as another as another open problem. It's something that seems quite accessible to this. So another generalization of this problem. Uh, so you can put Dirichlet boundary conditions. Another thing to do is to put a trapping potential, which is not so different from taking Dirichlet boundary conditions. And it would be interesting to see what happens to these simple equations if there's some sort of, of uh, gross pitayevsky type uh, of decoupling of, of, um, of scales in that case as well. So, uh, so far, so the answer to, your, to answer your question, so far, breaking translation invariance is not accessible to the computation that we did, but it seems to be a computation that is pretty much analogous and yeah but i'm puzzled about this because this factorization does not seem to work in an ideal gas which is not translation invariant that's correct. Uh, because in you know in ideal gas you know just the the, the ground state simply is the product of the same function and then g2 is exactly psi note x1 mm -hmm. times psi note x2 something like that, and G3 is psi note x1 times psi note, and you know, then I don't think this factorization is valid. In the translation, non invariant case. Yeah, so. Mm, but, but anyway, we can talk about this. Uh, but let later. me just make one comment about, about mm. this because that's actually quite interesting. Mm. If you break, break translation, so here you have G2, G3, and G4. If you break translation invariance, there's also a G1. Okay. And these yeah. are actually yeah. assumptions. Yeah not, uh, they're actually computed factorization mm. assumptions that uh, ensure that if you take partial integrals of G3 and G4, you end up with G2s. And so these assumptions would actually have to be different from okay. the, the non-translation okay. invariant. Good. Yeah. They would involve okay. G1, mm -hmm. that's absolutely right. Yeah, and you, you assumed a lot of things on the potential. What happens if it's the hard core? Does everything break down? Or? Very good question. Thank you for, for asking that. Uh, so it looks like everything should break down, but it doesn't. So uh, we can define the simple equation and the big equation for the hard core, no problem. A number of the theorems uh, are still true. Uh, so this theorem we actually proved. So still true doesn't mean that we, we wrote down a proof for it. It usually means that I have a proof for this in some note that's buried in my computer. So uh, we proved this. Uh, and this, that's still true for the for 
Uh, so so what, theorem one, two, and three? Uh, one and three. Two is no longer true. Uh, I mean, two, two doesn't make sense anymore. Two would be, would be infinite. So there's a point where it, where it breaks off. Uh, we also did some numerics for the hard core, uh, which is quite a bit more difficult than for the soft core, essentially because for the soft core, all the numerics are actually done in FOIA space, and for the hard core, things start to, to behave poorly in FOIA space. Uh, but uh, I essentially rewrote the code uh, in real space to be able to do the hard core, and we also get a fairly promising, well, okay results. They're not as good as for the soft core, at low density, everything everything still works well, um, but there's an, okay. So for the hard core, as a function of density, there's a critical density where the energy starts to blow up. Uh, even the location of this critical density is not so clear from the numerics to, uh, where where that that ends up for the simple equation or for the big equation for the hard core. But yeah. But that's certainly an advantage to Bogolyubov theory, which definitely does not work for the hard core. Uh, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, that's 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 true. Yeah. So we, yeah. Well, right. I mean, you can still do. It doesn't work rigorously, but you can still do computations, right? I mean, the. Well, I guess as long as I don't do that, I, they do the pseudo potential, so everything is replaced, anyways. But yeah, so um, yeah, so you can still deal with it and find predictions for the hard core uh, using approximations with fall, which fall within the scheme of 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 um, of the Leibov theory, right? Because there there's more than just the C number substitution and the killing of the of the of the cubic and quartic terms. There's uh, replacing the potential with appropriate potentials and things like that. And so that's still something that you can do for the hard core. Another approach to the hard core, incidentally, which seems to work quite well, is to take limits of soft cores, uh, which is also something that we've looked at. And for the simple equation and the big equation seems to, seems to, uh, to work rather well. And yeah. And so in fact, uh, for things like asymptotics of the, of the ground state energy, um, for the hard core, you can just take a soft core and then take the limit. But since it only depends, since the energy only, since these these orders only depend on the scattering length, of course this is non rigorous because you can't control the the remainder terms. But uh, you get a prediction. Yeah. Other questions? No other questions. So uh, I, I I have a question. Yes, uh, yeah. You mentioned that uh, that you use the Fourier Fourier space to analyze the the, uh, the, the problem. So, it, it, is it better to use the Fourier space or or the position space? So, um, okay. So, to do numerics, it's better to use Fourier. Let me try and convince you why Fourier is easier. Uh, let's look at the simple equation. Okay. So, the the difficulty uh, always lies in, in taking convolutions. From a numerical point of view, that's, that's where things uh, get difficult. From a conceptual point of view, at least when we're, when we're doing computations like the asymptotics for the energy, it's the correlation functions which, which uh, kind of pester us. But if you look at this equation in Fourier space, uh, you end up with ev everything looks really simple except for this term over here. Uh, so that's the nice thing about, about using Fourier space is everything becomes localized except for this term over here. And then what we do numerically is we do a Newton algorithm where we say, well, if we know what this term is, then, we, then I can tell you what U is. And then that again tells me what this term is. And then I go back and forth uh, using a Newton algorithm. And so essentially in Fourier space, uh, it ends up being easier. For the big equation, Fourier space is also easier. Uh, it turns out the reason for this is that if you take the Fourier transform of this, you still get convolutions in Fourier space, but there are fewer convolutions than there were in real space. And it's um, the the only thing that is computationally intensive in solving these these equations is taking integrals. And so every time you have a convolution, you get more integrals, and so you end up with something that gets gets more and more complicated. In Fourier yeah, space, but, you have fewer. But but the the Monte Carlo analysis of the of the problem. Uh, it's, it's not in, in the Fourier space. No. 
No, that's okay. correct. Uh, it's it's in real space, and right, yeah. and sometimes actually some of the proofs uh, are easier in in real space than in Fourier space. Uh, so in particular, I mentioned at the very end results about monotonicity for small density and high density. This is all done in real space. Uh, sometimes it's easier to manipulate Laplacians. Uh, it it kind of depends on on what you're looking for. But what is true is numerically, invariably. Uh, the Fourier space is computationally lighter. It's easier to compute in Fourier space than in real space for this problem. Thank you. Other questions? No other questions? So thank you very much, Jan. Let me stop the recording.